Hello, everyone. My name is Jason O'Neill. I'm the head of global training services for Kepner Trigo. My role at KT is to lead innovation, product development, and our go-to-market strategy for KT's many training uh, products and services. KT is a pretty exciting place to work right now. This is actually our 60th anniversary. We were started way back in 1958 by two of the nation's first social scientists in their garage in Southern California. And they turned Kepner Trigo into a pioneer of critical thinking. And since then, we've trained millions of individuals globally about how to change the way that people think. Um, we are now helping manufacturers improve product quality and throughput, IT functions improve system uptime, and learning and development functions establish a culture of problem-solving leaders so organizations can solve their problems and their toughest challenges fast. On that note, I'm so pleased to introduce our guest presenter today. Uh, our session on disruptive thinking will be led by one of KT's clients, Veena Raj Kumar. Veena has worked for companies including Hewlett Packard, Dell, Accenture, GE, the Jack Welsh uh, Technology Center, and Oracle. And she's now a learning and development manager with Tejile, a Western digital company. Veena has a wealth of knowledge in her field and a passion for innovation and executing creative learning and development solutions. She employs new methods in learning and design to encourage and motivate learners through the process of continuous improvement. Vina is truly a disruptive thinker with a growth mindset and a passion for people development. We're so very lucky to have her with us today, um, even when we're about to get about a foot of snow in the Pennsylvania, New Jersey area, as Vina has braved her way here to bring this content to you. So Vina, without further ado, please take it away. Thank you so much, Jason and everyone. This is actually my first experience of snow, so I'm really enjoying it. I look forward to disrupting your thinking process today. So the potential for reinvention is all around us, and it's an exciting time to be thinking about how to reinvent our thinking process. How about a way of thinking that produces an unconventional strategy? No one way of doing things is beyond improvement. How long did we put luggage on top of a cart with wheels before it took someone to think of putting wheels directly under our suitcase? Think what no one else is thinking and do what no one else is doing. How about wearing mismatched socks? If you're right-handed, why don't you eat, try eating spaghetti with your left hand? I actually tried that with authentic Italian spaghetti recently. I scooped a few spaghettis in a spoon and then twirled it around left hand with my fork clockwise. It was very effective. Most recently, I had to negotiate a discount for a conference room facility. Mm -hmm. The manager in charge said, that's impossible. I said, well, then make it possible. He said, I'll see what I can do, and reduced it to half. Not without a frown, though. We have, we have our own frame of reference through which we view the world. There are dominant ideas that always take precedence and create barriers to creative thinking. We depend on a set of assumptions and habits. My own personal example of assumptions at a team dinner. My colleague recommended that I try a Long Island iced tea. I visualized a tall glass of green tea with jasmine, a hint of ginger, and lemon. I took a few sips and experienced a warm, fuzzy feeling flow through. I thought to myself, 
tea shouldn't make you feel warm. I checked with the waiter and found out that it had tequila, rum, whiskey, and vodka. To my horror, I don't drink alcohol. I never have. What happened was that I heard the word tea and immediately arrived at the conclusion that it was green tea. And it was because of my own frame of reference to which I see the world. We get results based on what we do. And what we do depends on how we see the world around us. Our change in perception over time has created an explosive exchange of innovative ideas. In the beginning, many people perceived the world was flat. This perceived truth impacted behavior. People didn't travel far. They feared that they would fall off the edge of the earth. When people discovered that the world was actually round, behaviors changed. This change was reflected in the establishment of trade routes and extensive cross-cultural collaboration. A change in perception propelled the human race forward. So Jason, how can you be the disruptive change? <laughs> I'll, ju I'll you just keep it? interrupting you and that'll be disruptive enough. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good for me. I like the disruption. So ideas are the recipes we use to rearrange thought processes and create more values. Disruption is also about looking at what is obsolete, difficult, or challenging as an opportunity for a new way forward. How about looking at the poorest performer in your team and thinking of making that person your star performer? A question from the audience, which I think is worth um, mentioning, someone had jumped in and asked, what is the purpose and end product of thinking? That's such an interesting kind of high-level question. So what's the purpose and end product of thinking? Seems like a good thing to talk about before you get deep into it. Absolutely. Thinking is about strategizing. Thinking is about looking at the future, looking at the head, looking ahead, and thinking of a way to make a change for further development. Yeah, and I, I like to think about thinking just in terms of slowing down and organizing sometimes. When you're, you're trying to get to a, an end result, um, you know, when things are so fast around us, the thinking process can be difficult, and it actually takes more energy to think. And so you have to slow down and think about where you want to go and what information you might need to get there. Absolutely. And um, that's the key to, towards making a difference, really. And it's, it's all about, you know, how we grow and how we develop, right? So, so that's the real key. So why didn't Microsoft think of Google? Or why didn't AT&T think of Skype? When you start believing that your fundamental purpose is to alter your status quo rather than preserve it, and Jason, that's what I mean by change, right? It's also about constantly thinking about changing or altering the status quo. Sometimes we get stuck with the, with the status quo and we don't want to go beyond it, or we let that create a barrier. So thinking is important. Thinking in a different way is important to be able to alter that status quo. And so yeah, I, what it, yeah. I was going to say, I suppose you could kind of, kind of luck yourself into a, a disruptive change, but normally it's going to come from actual thinking about where you want to go and <laughs> strategizing, like you said, how to get there. It's not going to just come because, whoops, you fell into it. Not, not normally. Exactly. And, you know, when you start thinking about it, then what it does is it motivates you and your mindset starts to change as well. And when that happens, you begin to see opportunities beyond what others have set as limits. And you begin to rethink who you are and what you might become. And when you look at what sets apart Steve Jobs and Elon Musk apart, it's the willingness to disrupt the status quo and create that change. So it's really up to us and it's up to you to disrupt your thought process 
and be that vehicle of change. Don't you think, Jason? Yes, absolutely. That's, that's why we're here today. Absolutely. So then how do we become disruptive thinkers? You know that there's actually a method to the madness, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> Are you calling me mad? <laughs> yes. And okay, be fair. That's through, that's through the process of mining, landscaping, and building. The mining phase is where the mindset is one of curiosity and exploration. And it's in this phase that we do deep research, suspend the need to solve. How often are we so quick to think about solving the problem without actually thinking about trying to impose order or we're, we're constantly trying to impose order or trying to solve, right, Jason? Um, that's, yeah. that's our natural habit. Absolutely. Right? So landscaping is where we take all the parts that we uncovered during the mining phase and start to piece them together to form a landscaped view through mapping and exploration. Building is the creative ideas phase that allows for the development of divergent design ideas that build on potential connection points to leverage change. So the three distinct parts help you explore, discover, connect, evolve, and build a diversity of ideas into clear, concrete connections. And these connections don't need to be related, do they, Jason? No, and it's absolutely right. And when I originally heard you start, start talking about these concepts, Vina, I was sort of thinking, oh, this must be like a linear process in some way. But I, I think the examples you're about to show Will, will really show that they can be unrelated and handled in different ways. Exactly. And, and, you know, if you look at the mining process, you can start with total chaos. It doesn't have to be order to begin with, right? And so the mining is actually the divergent thinking process. And this, through this process, what you do is you embrace the chaos, and it allows us to use our imagination to explore, widen our horizons, and look at all sorts of new possibilities. We generate different ideas that are not connected with the original concept. We stretch the boundaries and let our imaginations generate many different possibilities. And through this process, the tools of this process are research, observation, exploration, curiosity, questioning, data collection, and creative insights. So a good example is when Crick and Watson discovered the structure of DNA in Cambridge in 1953. They used divergent thinking to consider all sorts of possible patterns and arrangements. It's obviously a great example that most everyone is familiar with, um, and obviously f foundational for um, for you know some of that original scientific thinking. And interestingly, just five years before KT was founded, 1953. <laughs> oh wow! Sorry, I had to throw that in there. It's our birthday. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you did, Jason. So you know, when you look at landscape, it's a mindset of connection where you see the world as a giant jigsaw puzzle that you're putting back together and creating a different perspective that enables a bird's eye view of the problem or any situation. The data, research, creative insights of the mining phase are gathered and locations of where to intervene in the system to leverage change are identified. So this is the stage where you start building connections. Landscaping is a convergent thinking process that allows us to use our knowledge and examine the concepts and see where they fit. The tools for this phase are emergence, identification, and synthesis. You, get, you begin to fit in the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle cohesively. 
Going back to the example of DNA, Crick and Watson used the convergent thinking to narrow down more specific patterns and structures and create a synthesis. Hey, hey Veena, I was just going to pop in here and mention that um, there, there's one question from our audience that I thought was interesting. It is backed up a couple of slides, but someone had asked, um, some of us have a reputation for living outside of the box, which leads to resistance to our next thought idea because it will bring change. Um, do you just remain satisfied with disruptive thoughts, or do they need to find like implementation before it matters? And it's also about, you know, J Jason, what, what I will be talking about later on, it's that belief, that conviction, it's also the emotional quotient that, that, that is important. You need to be able to believe in yourself, and you, need to, and you need to believe that new idea or that change will create an impact, will make a difference. And if you do, it will. And yes, when you come up with new ideas, it always creates resistance. You always come up with, what in the world are you talking about? But it's up to you to believe that you can make the difference, and you can. Right, and I, I think the, the question is so interesting because, I mean, we, we, we have a lot of folks in our company that are amazingly, amazing thinkers outside the box, but you can almost sense a resistance sometimes because they have so many new ideas. People know that they're trying to disrupt, and then the kind of the culture of resistance builds up to some of their ideas. And I think what you said is right on that the uh, emotional quotient has to come with it. You just can't be the disruptor and try and blow things up. You need to be the disruptor and find ways for those new ideas to take root. Uh, we, we could probably do a whole separate webinar series on the culture of disruption <laughs> and how to actually get it embedded, right, versus just Absolutely. the thinking process. Absolutely, Jason, and I love, I love the idea of doing that. We should consider that. <laughs> All right, wait a second. Are, you, are we signing up for another series here? Yes, 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 we are. You've All got right, me. Great. You've already <laughs> got me thinking ahead. <laughs> Very good. Right. So now we're going to talk about the third phase, the building phase. Do the tools of explore, understand, and evolve the building phase helps you evolve the concept so that the status quo is shifted. You leverage the mining process of research, chaos, insight gathering, the landscaping process of mapping, emergence, identification, and synthesis. And what you do is build a new creative reality. Crick and Watson use the building phase to arrive at a brilliant new discovery, the double helix. So now we come to our poll question, right, Jason? We do, and I think there's a slide with the question. So I've started the poll question. It should show up, I believe, right below your viewer. And the question is, what does disruptive thinking mean to you? Um, hopefully everyone can see that poll. So does it mean totally changing the culture of, your, of thinking at your organization or challenging the status quo, just being bold, Maybe embracing failure, a concept that you and I haven't talked about quite yet, Vina. Um, or certainly there could be a lot of other things that um, disruptive thinking can mean to you. And if you'd like to enter those into the questions from the audience, I think that'd be a great place to weigh in and uh, tell us what you're thinking. Because right now, Vina, challenge the status quo is the, uh, is the runaway favorite with uh, receiving most of the votes so far. Um, what's, it, what's it mean to you, Vina? Which one would you pick? I would pick embrace failure, Jason, primarily because, you know, it's through our failures that we learn and we, we think about ways of making things better. And failure is really the opportunity to think of ways of, of thinking ahead for the future. Yeah, I, I might pick the first one. Um, you know, changing the culture of thinking the organization only because that's you know, that's that's my worldview coming from a company that does uh, critical thinking. But I, 
I think that some, when people are comfortable being disruptive or more, multiple people are being disruptive, um, you, you know, you kind of build that culture where it's okay to think outside the box, to use that term, or wherever else. But it certainly seems like from our audience, the, uh, the challenge, the status quo, has uh, by far the most number of votes. Um, someone on the, on the call jumped in and said that uh, it means to them doing something radically different more than incremental change. So that's, you know, let's not just move the boulder a little bit. Let's just toss it down the hill and have it go as fast as possible. Um, another person came in and said, constantly challenge your vision and mission. And here's a great word. They said remain agile, which agile is a whole, obviously, wave of new ways to manage projects and, and get things done. And, uh, Vina, I would think agile would have a lot to do with really good disruptive thinking. Absolutely. And I loved all the choices, Jason. I really did. I think it's all about disrupting and disrupting and coming up with something new or even looking at what is existing and thinking of how to make that more interesting. Yeah, someone else came in and said, uh, a combination of sharing your thinking and allowing failure. And, of course, thinking of things that are different from now, at least for it to be shared and take root. So I like that. A combination of sharing your thinking and allowing for failure is pretty good. I love that. That's beautiful. Yeah, great. And failure hey, we is important. It is important. Nothing is going to be perfect. You're not going to have everything in place all the time, right? Um, it's so important to leverage f failure, treat that as a positive, and come up with some, some new, amazing new way forward. Yeah, so here's a great question, Vina. Moving on. So thank you for everyone who voted on the uh, poll question, I'm going to stop it here. Certainly challenge the status quo was the, uh, I would say, the big winner. Someone asked, um, the vast majority of people in organizations don't like change and love the status quo. So are we saying that you can convert them into disruptive thinking? And if so, how? I'm sorry, I missed that, Jason. Oh, sorry. Are you saying that... Um, for people that like the status quo, can we convert them into disruptive thinking? Yes, we can. Yeah, how would you re how would you recommend how would you do that? How would you get someone that is kind of stuck in the status quo to be converted into disruptive thinking? By actually demonstrating and showing that it can be done. You know, if, if someone says that's impossible, tell them that it can be possible. Question them. Um, you know, turn, try to convince them by, by asking them questions. And more than that, demonstrating it yourself. I think that makes a huge difference. Yeah, and I think this goes back to the previous question from a participant around, you know, disruptive thinking isn't just about thinking. It's about the, the, the culture change of, of disruption and getting people over to your side by kind of being able to relate to them and, and get them um, outside of their box, if you will. Exactly. And, and you also be that vehicle of change and you demonstrating the disruptive process and showing them that it can be effective. Um, I, I have worked with so many people that are resistant to change, but I keep showing them, motivating them. Motivating them is very important and letting them believe that it is possible and that it can be possible and that anything can be possible if you set your mind to it. Absolutely. Hey, Vina, we have so many good uh, questions from the audience. So someone asked, um, will we be able to download these slides afterwards? And absolutely, we will, we will share them. And uh, someone had said, I think kind of an, another, one of the other answers was, um, Keep asking, thinking, and trying. So asking, using questions, thinking, and trying. It's not going to happen overnight. So that was really good input. Beautiful. I love that. Don't give up. Never give up. Yeah, you got it. Okay, why don't you um, – What's? we have so many other good questions. Why don't you go through a little bit more of your content and examples, and then we'll come back to some questions too. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So are we ready to start? Yeah, go for it. All right. So really, many great ideas are based on combining existing ideas in new and different ways. One of the greatest inventions of time was the printing press, which was created by Johannes Gutenberg in 1440 in Strasbourg. He combined the flexibility of a coin punch with the power of a wine press. His invention transformed the spread of information in the Western world. It enabled the speedy dissemination of books, pamphlets, and papers on religious, political, and scientific issues. It was a key technology that enabled the Reformation and the Renaissance in just the same way that the Internet has enabled the knowledge economy. Two small ideas, the coin punch and the wine press, combined to make one mighty idea, the printing press. It was like magic that occurred when people first combined two soft metals, iron and tin, and created a strong alloy, bronze. In 1953, the British government held an auction for commercial television regions. Many companies were interested in bidding for the franchises. They analyzed the demographics of the regions to identify which were the wealthiest regions that would produce the most advertising revenues. Now, how often do we do that, Jason? We look at what is the most lucrative always, right, to, to our, based on our assumptions, our set assumptions. Right, yep. So the result was that they focused on London and the southeast of England. Sidney Bernstein was the managing director of a small chain of cinemas, Grenada Cinemas. He wanted to compete in the auction. He told his people, don't look for the richest region, look for the wettest. Find me the region with the highest rainfall. This turned out to be the northwest of England. Grenada bid for this and won it. Bernstein's idea was that it was better to have a region where it rained so much that people stayed in and watched TV, just like today's snow day, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we're not watching TV right now, though, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He sought one, what no one else thought. Grenada went on to produce many innovative programs, including Coronation Street. Yeah. Hey, Vina, just um, want to cover two things real quick. Um, Monica out there asked a question and said she's having a, a bit of a bad connection, and I'm hoping that, that – uh, sorry, Monica, that this is just isolated to you, um, but I think I can hear you fine, and we're okay with that. Just keep your volume up if you would. Um, and I think we're okay otherwise. We've got about 15 minutes left, Vina, so I want to make sure we have time for our second poll question, too. Just giving you a heads up. All right. Thank you so much, Jason. You got it. So how can we force ourselves to take a different view of the situation? Instead of looking at the scene from your view, try looking at it from a different perspective. Ask the question, what if? Challenge all common assumptions. Why do we immediately try to frame a solution? And this is what I asked in the beginning before we have approached a problem from different perspectives. Picasso took a different view of painting. He saw cubes, shapes, and impression instead of accurate images. Einstein imagined a new approach to physics, a world where time and space were relative. Just Jeff Bezos took a different view of book retailing with Amazon.com. And in India, in 1992, a dangerous new cholera epidemic was prevalent. Politicians and health officials spent their valuable time blaming each other. And how often do we do this whenever there's a problem, right? Our first Instead of looking for solutions, right? We, we start blaming each other as well. An Indian scientist, Ashok Gadkil, thought about how to decontaminate water without costly chemicals, are boiling. 
which required large amounts of fuel. He knew that ultraviolet radiation destroys bacteria, so he took the cover off a standard fluorescent light bulb and held it over a basin of water. The ultraviolet rays completely decontaminated the water. A change in perception created a proactive solution. Isn't that amazing? Incredible. Hey, Vina, we have a, a really interesting comment from the group and a question. Um, in terms of how to disrupt the status quo, that's going to be our question in the polls. You, so you can start um, finding the poll question below your viewer there and answering. Um, but someone had mentioned, what about the way we measure people? So don't just recognize people for the KPIs they achieve, but measure the inputs and outputs for what's you know, related to the type of disruption you're looking for. And so often I think those KPIs that people are held to uh, hold, them within that, hold them within the thinking box and not allow them to get outside. Have, have you seen that in your career? Yes, I have. You know, people have a set of, of measurements or standards for which they just hold fast to, and they're not willing to move out of that. Um, you know, and I, I, that, that is something that you see often, quite often, in, the corporate, in, in your corporate career. Yeah, for sure. And so we do have our poll question up, and so the question was, how will you disrupt the status quo? Um, I don't think I need to read the answers. You can see them. But the, the two right now that seem to be um, most popular would be a change agent within my organization. So there you go. There's that term change again that we talked about before. And be willing to fail and encourage it for my team. So another um, kind of series of votes for failure as well that's important. Um, but, you know, what goes along with culture change is the environment where that can take place. And so that's that third popular answer about creating an environment where innovation can take root. You, you probably need to have the environment before you can have the disruptors. Because if you have the disruptors and not a good environment, they're going to be they're going to be outcasts and not be able to get anything done. What, what would you vote for, Vina? How to disrupt the status quo? Yeah. I would say... Be creative. Become. Be willing to um, be a divergent thinker to start with. Embrace the chaos. That would be my answer. So I would choose something totally different. <laughs> yeah, very good. Good. Um, Think and, ways to choose something different and be different. Another good question was, are there any specific tools that you use to improve disruptive thinking? Well, the, the, the primary tools are to be divergent. And from the divergent process, you do the research, the questioning, the data gathering. And then from that, you think of ways that you can create connections. And sometimes the connections can be totally unrelated. And from that, you start to build and you start looking at new ways and you evolve from that. And and it's sort of like negotiating in a way, right? So yep. when, when you're trying to create a win-win, um, what you do first is you explore the ways in which you defer. And from that, you try to arrive at some way that both of you see um, some sort of similarity and perhaps or connection is a better word. And from that connection, you build from that. And that's exactly what uh, disruptive thinking is. It's building from something unrelated, building from something related, and finding a new way forward. Yeah, that's great. Vina, a few of our folks out there have an entered in other answers that I love. So um, what is this? What, how will you disrupt the status quo? Um, someone said it's more about exploiting and amplifying disruption. That's fun. So someone likes disruption. That's fun. <laughs> Uh, someone mentioned, do we really need to look for disruptors? Don't they just come naturally? That's such a good point. Um, uh, enlarge the box. So don't break the box. Enlarge the box. That's cool, too. You've got to give people a safe place to think. And if the box is bigger, that can help tremendously. Um, be willing to stand out and fail. 
Um, someone mentioned, I always measure people on failure. What did they fail at and how did they apply those lessons? Oh my gosh, I want to uh, report to that person. Whoever you are out there, that's, I want you to be my future boss. Awesome. Same here. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love my uh, boss. K someone, yeah, someone said KPIs is a bad word. Be a, an agent for continuous improvement. So such great feedback from from the audience. So thank you so much, everyone, for your votes. We're almost over 100 votes for each of those poll, poll questions. That's great. I'm going to stop the voting, Vina, and let's get to the uh, end of your presentation. We'll come back and answer some more questions. That sounds fantastic, Jason, and I loved the disruptive thinking process. I really love the disruptive thinking process that's going on right now. Wonderful. So, Jason, what is the number one, what do you think is the number one leadership competency of the future? Oh, were you asking me personally or what the research shows? I'm asking you personally. Oh, I'm so biased. I, critical thinking. You've got to be able to, to look at all of the, through big data and through the, um, just the tumultuous change going on all around us and still fall back on those roots of good critical thinking. But that's just my view. What about yours? I, I think that creativity is the number one leadership competency of the future. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there are elements that tend to create a defensive mindset. Greg Neal, a top sales executive in the global pharmaceutical industry, has identified three elements which can create a defensive mindset. These elements can be summarized as get, G, gain, my personal gain, E, emotion, my identity, my insecurities, T, territory, my budget, my project, my expertise. In a fast-moving environment, friction develops. Don't give in to the temptation to defend yourself. You're there to understand. A change in perception leverages differences and transforms a defensive mindset to a proactive one. A wonderful example is a Lego toy maker company. They noticed that customers were secretly hacking into their systems to order individual parts to build their own creations. Lego came up with proactive software that would encourage customers to create new designs and share their designs with other customers. This resulted in many new innovative ideas that made the Lego brand even more popular and successful. Lego provided the raw material and the customers created the designs. A change in perception can do wonders and result in proactive solutions and creative conflict resolution. So Jason, have you ever thought of conflict as a creative process? But, so it's such an interesting question. Um, and even observing it within um, Kent Rodrigo or my previous employees, like some people look at conflict always as a negative. And when people are comfortable to butt heads, to disagree, even to get the you know the conversation a little bit emotionally charged, in a in an environment where that's appropriate, uh, the the amount of creativity and, and and a change of thinking that can come out of that is can be very powerful. Absolutely, Jason. And you know something else that's really really important is emotional intelligence. It's essential yep. for creative conflict resolution, and it's also very important in the disruptive thinking process. Daniel Goldman has developed a model of emotional intelligence as a set of four key leadership skills. Self-awareness is the first one. And self-awareness is a tool that I use in all my training sessions because it's only when one is self-aware of one's emotions, one's areas of improvement, and what's one's strengths that one can even begin to motivate and move forward. Self-management, the second skill, the ability to control one's emotions and moods. The third, social awareness, the ability to see and understand other people's emotions. And the fourth, relationship management, the ability to inspire, influence, and develop. So it's important to ponder, meditate, reflect 
What happened and why did it happen in that way? How did I think and feel about what happened? What did I learn from this experience? How will I change behaviors and attitudes? So it's really important to focus on the most important priorities and to also understand that we learn more from failures than success. Thomas Edison said, each experiment taught me a new way that did not work. The Wright brothers, if birds can fly, why can't I? They went through many failures before they created the prototype of the airplane. It was their self-belief and positive attitude that propelled them forward. So it's so important to think positive, and it's your attitude that determines your mindset, which determines your behaviors and the outcomes in your life. So believe in yourself. Your conviction that you are capable of significant achievement is very important in the disruptive thinking process. If your journey is haphazard, leverage that opportunity to create a new way forward. So often in my career as well, I remember there was a phase where I was looking for the perfect job, and I went through a phase where I couldn't find it for almost six months. And then I told myself, why don't I give myself a job? And then I did. I became an independent consultant, and I never looked back from that. So it's just about changing the way you think. And when you change your perception and move away from what is predictable, it creates an explosion of unpredictable creativity. So how will you get rid of that box in, in your thinking? And what will you go back and do differently? What is your disruption, disruptive action plan? Over to you, Jason. All right. Hey, we have probably time for one more question, and there's a, there's a handful of really good ones, Vina. Um, let me grab this one. So um, how would you go about encouraging your manager to understand the benefits and embrace disruptive thinking so you're just not looked at as the disruptive person? Um, for me personally, my manager is a highly disruptive thinker. I keep coming up with crazy creative ideas, and she encourages everyone, everything. So really, the key is to come up with a project, come up with a new project, set um, you know, let the project know that you, let the manager know that you're going to be in charge of that, and show them that it can actually work. Yeah, and I would say, can you can you act disruptive without um, without really making the person feel like it, right? And there, there's probably a a whole separate webinar we could talk about where. We talk about how do you be disruptive without people feeling like you're blowing things up. Um, and so it's just probably if you have the reputation for being disruptive, thinking about how to present your ideas in a way acceptable to the person who normally likes to think within the box. And, and it's also about creating that change within, that, within your organization, encouraging discussions, encouraging divergent thinking sessions. I think that's the starting point. Um, you know, every week or every day have a session where everyone sits in a room and just comes up with divergent different ideas. And right. then, you know, the following week maybe you can think of a way to create, a, uh, con create connections from that, you know. And so I think on a regular basis, if, if your organization or if you are a champion for this and you come up with ways to encourage and motivate people to have more divergent discussions, I think that is a starting point. Vina, we are running out of time, so I'm going to take this opportunity to close us out and thank you so very much for doing this with us. For the folks out in the audience who we didn't get to answer your questions, we will. We'll get back to you by email. Um, and we want to make sure you give us feedback. So please click the rate button, rate this button, and let us know what your thoughts are. And if you have follow-up questions, you can easily find both Vina and me on LinkedIn, um, or we'll send our information over by email and make sure we follow up. There will be a recorded version of this session and the slides, so you're more than welcome to use that, and we welcome your dialogue. 
So on, on behalf of Vina and Tejile for Western Digital Brand, thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate it. This will be a, um, a series of webinars in the future, and we're really looking forward to continuing them with you. We'll hope you come back. Again, thanks, Vina, and everybody have a great day. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, everyone. I loved it. Take care now.